So at this point, what I would like to do is to address Mr. Nesro. <laughs> so we begin with the oldest of our guests. Um, just to tell us about why is this film relevant somehow, and what is relevant in, with respect to what Soto actually himself does in this film with his own works, because with all these movements like that, he looks more like a magician trying to do some tricks. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll leave the word to Mr. Nesro. Thank you. All right. Uh, I don't know if we need a microphone or not, but I'll come in. Maybe. Can you all hear me? Yeah. More or less? Okay. Maybe we could use it. All right. It will. Hello? Okay. Yeah, there's also a page um, over there. Yes, I just, um, first I'd like to thank you, Sandro, and um, the staff at Bosé Contemporary. This has been just a really wonderful experience to be involved with the exhibition, um, the catalog, and here on this panel um, to share a panel with um, Anish, Alma, and Ariel is truly a privilege, very humbling. Um, but about the film, I have um, just a few loose impressions, um, if you'll indulge me to kind of share with you. And I've seen it a few times now, um, but I remember when Sandra first set, sent it to me, um, in an email I was first astonished that the film even existed in the first place, because this is a real discovery um, to kind of unearth it from those archives. Um, but I was more surprised at the nature of the film, because Soto has been the subject of uh, of other films before, mostly documentaries that date back to 1955 um, with the Le Mouvement exhibition at Denis Cernay Gallery. Um, Robert Greer produced a, um, a film kind of documenting the works that were on there. But this um, film from 1968 with the Marlborough Gallery feels is very different um, because Soto seems to take a much more direct um, kind of involvement with it and the, the nature of the film itself, kind of as an experimental, non-narrative film, um, kind of functions almost as a work of art, I would say, in its own right. And um, I think the fact that it is um, kind of a very experimental film in which Soto is delivering aphorisms about energy and light and matter um, in Spanish and in French is um, significant. But um, because it's not about Soto or about Soto's career, um, or it's not even um, about the particular exhibition at the gallery, even if it does function as a kind of um, cinematic catalog, if you will. Um, and I think for me, coming from the angle of, of the art historical angle, because I must confess I'm not a film historian, but I'm most interested in how it depicts the experience of viewing the works, because um, the film employs a variety of, of cinematic strategies that, that serve, I think, to very much disorient the viewer. It's very difficult to see um, and understand many times what we're seeing um, through the use of extreme close-ups, vertiginous angles, shifts of focus, abrupt cuts, sudden zooms, and everything is working, um, I think, to evoke a very visceral, phenomenological experience rather than depicting the works as we might see them, see them in the gallery as coherent, um, singular objects. Um, and it extends to sound as well. So I would say it's a, not just a sensory experience, but a multi-sensory experience. And I think um, with respect to that, um, it's important to note that the sound, um, the score sounds like a fairly um, standard experimental ele electronic score from the period. But it's important to note, um, as Sandra told me, that it's actually a recording of the sounds that the works make themselves as so those playing only filtered and distorted, I believe, yes. Um, and you mentioned to me during, um, when we were just seeing, that it, it appears as if he's playing the works, as if it's a musical instrument. And Soto was a renowned guitarist. And in many of the contemporaneous um, articles and reviews of his work, it's um, it's very much likened to music. And the fact that he was a guitarist is, is brought up time and time again, which is kind of another story in and of itself. Um, but I think the issue of music is also kind of floating around in there. So I think that the kind of overall illegibility that kind of comes to a crescendo at the very end with this kind of overwhelming experience of the camera kind of spinning around and so the violently playing with the works um, really stresses um, that sensory experience over a kind of legibility or clarity um, to the extent that it's thwarting legibility. And I think that that is um, actually a, a, a hallmark of his work, um, like much of kinetic and optical art, is about kind of testing the limits of form and, and kind of the effect that uh, 
viewers' kind of own visual kind of input, or so to speak, um, can can work with form or, or kind of make form transcend its own kind of formal parameters, if that makes sense. Um, and we see that with the plexiglass, his early plexiglass compositions, where um, there are layers of transparency that have um, painted forms that shift depending on the viewer's relationship to to them. Um, and even in the later works, where he uses the familiar pattern of striated lines um, and an object position in front of it, like we see with the Rombo Cabalto over right here in this exhibition, um, to, to dissolve the given object optically. So it's kind of um, the film kind of visualizes that experience of, of disorientation or, or um, destabilization. So that was my first kind of ex um, impression. But I think also the fact, for number two, in the fact that Soto appears in the film is also very significant because he's described his work as, uh, on more than one occasion, as being one of relationships rather than the object itself. Mm -hmm. And this could, um, these interrelations could be translated to the, the relationships between the formal elements within a piece, um, the relationship between object or viewer, or most abstractly, the relationship between the work itself and a larger abstract kind of concept that he's working with. Um, and with the film, I think what's most obvious and most interesting to me, at least, is the subject, is the object viewer relationship. Because he is, um, He's really kind of testing, or not testing, but he's uh, visualizing or helping to visualize the dynamics of that relationship because he is physically intervening. And I think we see the works here in the gallery and don't want to necessarily touch them because just being kind of trained as um, museum goers or gallery goers, we don't want to, there's a kind of barrier around the work that something just violates completely from, from the get go. And, so it's a strong element in, in, the, in what he's actually doing is mm -hmm. that of encouraging exactly the, 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 the participation to the works right so i think the film which is here. completely opposite to, to whatever museum goers or art viewers they just do. definitely and i think what we can take away from the film is that the, these aren't necessarily static objects they're not kind of meant to be cloistered off from the viewer but rather the viewer is supposed to um, kind of set them into motion and I think for him, his, his call for participation, he says that contemporary art is the art of participation, is, does have a very literal dimension for him, um, where the viewer is invited to, to touch, to manipulate, to engage um, with the work. And I say viewer because Soto really seems to be enacting the role of the viewer in the work, um, where he's eliminating this boundary between artist and viewer, and that's something that comes up in his work in general. Um, but I think there is something very democratic, um, and we might say universal, or, or maybe rather universalizing, mm -hmm. about his work. Um, the prospect that anyone can interfere, that anyone can kind of be an artist in their own right, or that the work is incomplete somehow without a viewer to kind of set it into motion, either visually or, as we see in the film, actually physically. And I think, and surely as the creator of the works, he's absolutely in a privileged position to manipulate, he's quite violent with them at the very end. But, um, but I think it is a kind of invitation to, to the viewer. And it's something that he's working with um, from the get-go, kind of downplaying the role of the artist as a kind of exalted individual who might have ex a kind of, he's downplaying the, the expressive component of art mm. um, from his earliest works where he kind of applies a much more impersonal composition in his painterly style when he is painting. <laughs> is very um, impersonal and it almost looks kind of mechanical or, or technological in a way. Um, and I think this is nothing new by 1968 and he's kind of um, established this as one of his um, kind of a, a modus operandi, so to speak. Um, but the film is making this kind of relationship explicit. And so I think um, the film really demonstrates that these are not necessarily objects that present ideas, and they're not hy hypothetical objects, they're not hypotheses, but they're actually um, material things, um, and they have a material presence even if they do engage concepts of, say, energy or dematerialization, much more abstract kind of um, things. And this is, I mean, I'll admit this is quite a banal observation, but it's an important distinction because he's interested in abstract concepts and that transcendence of the object, but it's always rooted in the object itself. 
And I think as a final point, it's um, important to note that the viewer within all of this isn't necessarily immune um, in this object-viewer relationship because as we see, um, Soto not only says you are the object, but Soto himself undergoes a kind of fragmentation or dissolution in the film, whether his face is, is dissolved or obscured by um, its relation, by a work that's kind of placed in front of it, um, or kind of placed beyond the depth of field so that it's out of focus, um, to the, or whether it's his hand being kind of disembodied from it as a kind of just the focus of it, or um, his voice most prevalently disembodied or dislocated from his own kind of being, so to speak. Um, and I think this is that it, it's getting to that kind of inseparability between the artist um, or artist viewer, so to speak, and the work itself. Um, so I think those are kind of a collection of thoughts um, that really struck me about it. Um, but it, it's, I'm most impressed at how nicely, and actually how perfectly, strangely, the film articulates some of his main ideas and works as a kind of almost a cinematic manifesto in a way. But I'd be very interested to hear what anyone else has to say about it. I, well, I have a very brief conversation. My impression was, actually I have seen a few times too, but it is basically a user manual, right? It becomes a user manual and also a model that how uh, one should interact with the world, right? Um, I really thank you, but thanks for everyone for this panel and, you know, inviting me. And I'm not a Latin American specialist, I work on post-war France, and I work on Graf, an artist group which in 1962 very famously asked viewers to participate and forbid them to not to touch the work, right? Uh, but um, so it's a user manual, it's a kind of model which itself becomes a user manual for us. Of course, it's deeply problematic because the question is that was it ever possible to be as aggressive and interact with the work? I don't know what would you think if I would get up right now and I would go into these works and start to kind of play music with them. You did it actually. Okay, because I'm, I, but I think that if we all get in there, you know, there, there's a, there is this problem that we I'm going to go solo. Exactly. So it's always problematic, but it functions as such. And the second thing, what I was thinking about when you were talking about, he says this that um, right, all men contribute to the work of art. And you know that Soto was the champion. In '65, uh, Gallery de Nice uh, published uh, Soto Magie. Right? It was a box. It was called Biographie en Boat, Biographie en Marise. Duchamp Bois de Marais, which the first edition was finished in 43, right in New York, you know, just at Warner was working on it. So, Soto Magie, a box which contains small miniature replicas of Soto's work. 65, he did that. And when he says that all men contribute, he's basically echoing the very famous, at a time not very well known, kind of lecture by Duchamp, 61, at the MoMA, when he said that, after all, it is always the spectator who makes the work. And we know that for Duchamp, Duchamp's whole practice was about this, right? How to get away from painting. After two, the last painting he made, which is about relationships, whose nature we don't know, because who is you, who is me, who is te, tu, who is me, right? But uh, it, I, I, I'm just kind of complete, because I just realized that Duchamp, what he says is exactly the same thing that Duchamp is saying. So those two things, right? I see the very obvious. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sandra, for having us here today. I am, uh, in 2010, I organized an exhibition called Supersensorial Experiments in My Color and Space, and I included Soto in it with a penetrable. And as many of you know, one of the greatest contributions that Soto has uh, given us is the invention of the penetrable, which is a work like this that you can actually walk into it, that you can be inside the work and, and complete it with your presence in it. And um, I wish I would have had this film. You know, I, I we researched films and we finally found a documentary in Soto. And of course we had to start this, this very long process of negotiating <laughs> screening fees and so on for this one particular uh, film. But I wanted to show our audience because all I had I had a beautiful 14 meter long penetrable in the exhibition. It was huge. 